Master Sergeant Adrian Philip Hawkshead, United States Air Force, Vietnam. Adrian had a very unique role in the Vietnam War. He was a combat photographer. I have a couple of stories like that. Adrian was one of them. As you see pictures of him, you'll see him. He looks like part of the combat assault crews, but he flew in a lot of helicopters, a lot of combat missions. I met him in Monroe, Louisiana, May 11, 2007, almost 17 years ago. I was there doing a story with the CBS Evening News with White Andrews and, and all the, the crew at CBS. It was a great time. They featured that story, that new story on Memorial Day that year. But Adrian, unsung hero, folks, as you listen to him, I think he saw and he experienced way more than he told me. Very humble man. You could tell the war affected him. But um, I lost Adrian in 2012, only five years after this interview at the age of 69. When I interviewed him, he was 64. He went into the military in, at the age of 18 in 1961 was in Vietnam, 69 and 70. He flew mainly with the AC-130 Hercules gunship. It was a heavily armed um, aircraft that was used for close air support, um, armed reconnaissance, interdiction missions, and search and night rescue missions, and just a very um, well-known, uh, kind of a secretive gunship in Vietnam. You don't hear much about the AC-130s. But you look at their, their logo, their patch, it's very interesting as you look at that, the design of that patch. But Adrian flew with these crews in, in, in combat missions, combat assaults. He flew with this armed gunship, like I said, that was used a lot in Vietnam. He also flew with the F-100 aircraft and the UH-1 Huey helicopter. So he was combat photographer out there with them in the midst of everything. Received a Distinguished Flying Cross Air Medal with six Oak Leaf Clusters, so a decorated veteran. Lost, like I said, lost him in 2012, and uh, I, I just love his story as he tells it. Those of you who are students of history really appreciate Adrian's perspective and his vantage point as a combat photographer in Vietnam. I love learning from these stories. A lot of you are learning about Vietnam through these stories just because of so many stories, hundreds of stories now told by different people and uh, different branches of the military. I want to mention that Adrian served with the 16th SOS Special Operations Squadron in Vietnam, which is part of the 8th Air Force. You don't hear a lot about them, but they were used mightily during the assaults, the combat assaults in Vietnam. I want to thank Rory Payment for stepping forward. Rory, it's great working with you this first time. You came to me and said you wanted to sponsor this story. I'm so happy that you did. Thank you for allowing me to share Adrian's story, making it possible for it to be in heard and seen around the world. And thank you for your dedication to our veterans and our country, Rory. I salute you and I hope to work with you again. And folks, with that, I would encourage you, if you'd like to donate to this work, there's information in the video description and in the comment section of all my videos. You can go to my website also and donate through my website, LarryCapetto.com. Let's see if I forgot anything here. I'm just My heart's always full, folks, and uh, just really happy to share Adrian's story with you today. And as we go forward, I want to thank all of those who are helping support my YouTube channel and my radio station. You know who you are. I say God bless you. I pray for you. I know God will bless you for it. Okay, folks, thank you for watching and listening to these stories, subscribing to this channel. I'm happy to share Adrian's story with you today. I'm excited to do it. He'll also be featured on my radio station. Uh, KVOH Radio, Voices of History Radio, and thank you for those of you who have stepped forward to help support and keep that station on the air. I really, really need your help, and I thank you for those that are helping. Amen. All right, God bless you, and I'll talk to you again. How old are you now, sir? Uh, 64. Okay. When did you go to Vietnam? In 1969 and 70. One tour over there? One, yes, sir. Okay, you were uh, a combat photographer? Right. Okay, was that like your MOS that you went into? Right.
Okay, and where did you go to your basic training at? Lackland, mm -hmm. in 1961. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what do you remember about the mood of the country back during the time you went in? Was there, you think, uh, you hear a lot of stories about the, the country didn't support the troops at that time in 69, 70, I mean, what, do you, what, what, what was the mood and why did you join the military? Um, I had an uncle that was a colonel and I just wanted his life. Um, he uh, got to travel all over the world and uh, I kind of thought that was what I needed to do. And so you're how old at this time? 64. No, at the time you went in? Oh, um, 18. Okay. Young man? Yes, sir. Serving this country. So how did you get involved with the combat? What was your official title? Well, I actually had three. The first one was uh, I worked in, in administration, mm -hmm. and then I got tired of that, so I cross-trained into photography. And we actually had uh, several titles. One was Mopic for motion picture. Um, uh, we also did instrumentation photography. And then I got into to the combat part of it in 69. So you saw a lot of combat, even though you weren't, were you part of the combat? Or yes, you sir. Around it? You were, no, well, I was, was part it of it. In the air or on the yeah. ground? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of trips uh, on the ground. Uh, we would take helicopters down south um, and photograph some of the things that they were doing down there. But for the most part, it was all uh, aerial motion picture photography. Of uh, just the, the 130s or the helicopters? Or I flew both the, the uh, well, actually, I flew three. I flew the, no, I flew four. Um, I had responsibilities of the AC 130 gunship. I was in CRC in charge of that. I was a flight trainer and the examiner. So I had, my days were full. And when I wasn't doing anything with the AC-130s, I had some friends that I knew at Eglin Air Force Base, or Harbor Field, that uh, were there with the uh, OB-10 Bronco, and they used it as a forward air controller airplane in Vietnam. And I flew several, well, probably 12, 15 missions with them because I, I knew them and uh, they had asked me to come fly some with them. I flew the UH-1 uh, helicopter gunship. Uh, I flew F-100s. What's on that DVD? Any of the UH-1s or? No, it's it's all AC-130. Okay. Shots of them from the air? Yes, sir. We shot at night through a night observation device, and it was actually pictures that we took of trucks going down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and it showed our aircraft firing on them, explosions, uh, damage to them where you tried to box them in where they couldn't go anywhere. You'd always go for the first one and the last one. What, what, what was the purpose of the, one, the AC-130, is that what you call it? Yes, sir. What was, did that do any napalm or Agent Orange or what, what, what did that carry? Uh, we were strictly a gunship. Okay. What kind of guns on there? We had, at that time, we had four 20 millimeter cannons and four 7.62 mini guns. So you were providing air support for the ground troops or what? No, sir. We Our, our main objective was the Ho, Ho Chi Minh Trail and uh, knocking the trucks out so they couldn't resupply. That was our main function. We had several TICs. Um, we hit sand pans, we hit buildings. Yeah. Once we were cleared um, by the, the command aircraft that was circling around 24 hours a day. Uh, was, uh, are you guys fighting the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong or what are you doing? We, we didn't really know who we were fighting. Um, mostly it was in North Vietnam, the uh, VC, um, and 
I think it before I left there was some uh, Chinese that got into it now okay I, I don't know about that but uh, we had a bounty on our heads anybody with the AC-130 gunships if uh, they ever got shot down uh, we knew where we were going and it wasn't in Vietnam we were going straight to Red China Do you feel, um, now you're, you're mainly involved in aviation in the air, right? You, and you said you flew the UH-1s, right. combat missions, assaults, or what did you do? I had, uh, what was so funny about it is I had five days left in country. And once I got back to Tonsonoot to clear out, to go home, I walked in and my boss told me to pick up one of my other cameramen mm -hmm. and sent us on a uh, Vietnamese combat assault for three days where the Air Force had trained uh, the Vietnamese pilots in the UH-1 and they were doing a uh, combat assault as their last official act in training. Well, the Huey was used a lot in Vietnam. Yes, it was. The workhorse. Yes, sure was. And you, you were a pilot? No, I was a, a gunner. Okay. The, or a photographer. Okay. Not a gunner, a photographer. So would you fly in with the troops or by yourself, or what would you do, like on the Hueys? On the Huey, we would fly in uh, taking pictures as we came in and as we landed in the LZs. And uh, the troops debarking the airplane or the aircraft and then we would take off again with the same aircraft. So you were shot at at times in a hot LZ or? <laughs> yeah. Was that scary? Yes, it was. How, how, did, how did you react? How did you hold on? I mean, describe where you were with all these troops, in the back, in the front. Well, in the UH-1, we were in that cargo compartment where they had three or four on one side and three or four on the other side and they would double exit. Mm -hmm. um, I had a photographer on, on the ground that would shoot some of the incoming troops. M and my main job with only several days left in country was uh, to, to stay with the airplane. I figured that was the best chance I had. Were you scared on those combat missions? Yes, sir. Very that? much so. Did you take any video of the troops, sir, or any film of the troops, sir? No, sir. It was mainly just a motion picture of them coming in and landing and the troops debarking. And then later that afternoon, we would go back, fly into the same LZ, pick the troops up, and then we'd go back. You don't have anything on record that I could have from that? I mean, that's all confidential stuff, classified? Well, uh, it's not classified. I just, I didn't get anything. Oh, you don't have anything? No, sir. I, the most of my stuff was done on the, on the AC-130. Okay, so there's nothing of the troops coming in and out. How would, how would I obtain some of that? Is there a way to do that? or? I'm sure the film depository in uh, Washington or wherever it's located would would have photos on the uh, UH-1. But I mean film footage? Yes, sir. Of troops coming off of helium? It'd be stuff that we shot that should should been cataloged and, and saved. But can a person a access that information or is it? Yes, sir. For, for a fee or what? Oh, yeah. It's a big fee. So you'd have to contact somebody in the government or what? Either that or you'd really have to know how to, to search the, uh, the website. And, uh, you can I'll, download that stuff on the website? Yes, sir. You can? If you can find it. I've tried numerous times to find the footage, um, especially in February of 70. I'm looking for a particular day that we received battle damage on our AC-130. And I'm just not, either I'm not searching right or I don't know where it's located. And I talked to one of the uh, 
historians there that uh, their prices start about eight hundred dollars. Wow. And I figured, well, you know, I've got a little bit of what I did. And that's going to suffice. The SC-130, uh, we, by record, with uh, 8th Air Force, which was our parent command over there, uh, we had approximately 500,000 rounds of ground fire shot at us. And we had two incidents. We had an 85 millimeter airburst outside the airplane. Luckily, we didn't have any damage. And the, the part that I'm looking for is back in February of 70 when we actually got hit in the uh, left wheel well in the, in the, to the rear of the wheel well, which was not more than three feet from where we were standing. And when we got back to our base, luckily, um, we had to land on the right wheels, and then the pilot had to bring it down to land properly. And there was skids and sparks and everything like that coming off that right hand side, our left hand side wheel well where everything had been blown out. Do you remember the mood of the troops that were on the helicopters going into combat? Were they talking? Were they quiet? Do you remember any of that? Um, it kind of depended on on how and and why they were going in. You know, if they were on stage just a day, um, they were pretty talkative. But if they were going in for like a five or six day uh, recon, then they were really really quiet. You think they had seen combat before? Sure. We took an awful lot of Rangers and, and Green Beret and all that kind of stuff in in the uh, Hueys. And dropping them off in the LZs, was it chaotic or was it controlled? It was pretty controlled. Uh, I don't remember any instances where we, we had any chaos. Do you remember any casualties, being maybe troops being shot getting off, or was it ever that serious? It, for, for some reason, it really wasn't that serious. Yeah. Um, I guess I was lucky. I guess, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, why do you think they refer to Vietnam as an unpopular war? Well, um, I'm not really sure why they call it an unpopular war, but I do know uh, that I'm still pissed off. Um, when we came back, we were the only people in all the wars that we fought that w were met outside the air base at Travis when we got back. And people were demonstrating, calling us baby killers, and they would throw eggs and, and rotten apples and tomatoes and spit on us, you know, and it just really tore my jaws. Um, I wasn't doing anything more than what my country asked me to do. It's a shame that that happened. Sure is. We we still haven't been recognized. The Vietnam War era. You think it's different with the troops returning today? Is it better than it was? Yeah, because uh, there's a lot of of people out there all over this country that are going out of their way to meet these returning troops, and I think that's the greatest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Have you ever gone out to meet them? Several times. Yeah, like here in the area? Yes, sir. At, at the airport here? Right. Huh. Mm -hmm. I think that would mean a lot to the troops today to have that support. I hope so. How do you feel about the Vietnam War in general as far as you hear some people say, we lost the war or the politicians lost the war? I mean, how do you, what are your thoughts about all that? all the politics of all that or whatever? Uh, I would say that the civilians lost it for us. 
if they had just let us alone and let our commanders in the field do what they know how to do, that there would have been a different outcome. Were you, did you ever have a weapon in Vietnam or? I had a 38 combat special and an M16 that I took on every mission with me. Did you feel like you were in the way or they, they knew you were there or I mean, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we definitely weren't in the way. Once we get through shooting our cameras and our aircraft started back to Yuban, uh, several photographers I would, I remember would go back there and help the gunners shovel brass into these big bags so they could reprocess them and uh that you know, that's not something we really had to do but we just part of teamwork what kind of cameras did you guys have we shot the uh, 16 millimeter aeroflex and you'd send the film back or have it processed there we processed it at our home base there at yuban and then it got on a courier airplane the next day and then it headed to Washington DC uh, every every day. Were there a lot of you doing that or just a few? We had, uh, it started off with about seven or eight people yeah. and when I got ready to leave we had probably 14 you ever think about Joe Rosenthal, World War II, or, or, or you know, um, Lou Lowry, or all these guys that were, were they like, uh, you know, the combat correspondents of the past? I mean, that's kind of what they did, too. Right. right. Yes, sir. Do you ever, you know, the flag raising at Iwo Jima, how important that picture was or has become? Right. So this is something you wanted to do, huh? Yeah. We were stationed in Hawaii and uh, we actually went up to the National Cemetery there at Punch Bowl yeah. and looked up uh, uh, Powell. Mm -hmm. We looked him up and found his grave. Yeah. And that was, that was kind of neat. What was the hardest part of your job, Adrian, in Vietnam? We had to load our cameras in the dark because if we had any light anywhere that could be seen from the ground, um, it brought more accurate AAA. And uh, to me, I think that would probably be about the worst or the hardest thing for us to do because you really had to know how to use the Aeroflex in order to load it in the dark. And uh, I did it for 10 months. One of the scariest things that I ever had done was when I first got to Vietnam. My boss told me that uh, I would probably be going to U-Bond to take over in CIC. And he wanted me to fly the AC-119 gunship out of uh, Tonsonut. And uh, my very first mission, I flew with, with them. I was on the intercom, and I heard the pilot say, well, we're going we gonna to turn the, or we're going to go a little bit faster so we can throw more fire out the back so they can see how to shoot us. And it's like, man, these people are crazy. Why, you know, what am I doing up here? But uh, yeah, that's all part of it. That's interesting talking to you. Um, most of the people I talk to, you know, been in combat and actual combat, but I wanted to talk to you because I think it's interesting what you did and very important what you did. And, uh, uh, we were we were in combat every night. It's just we were flying and the other guys were on the ground. And now, did she said something about Agent Orange? Have you suffered the effects of that? Or yes, sir. Um, How were you exposed to that? going in with some of the rangers on some of the helicopter flights and uh, some of the uh, the 123s that gave the Agent Orange <clears throat> or that dispensed the Agent Orange uh, actually loaded some of it right there at Ubon right next to our revetments and it was I mean it was everywhere you couldn't help but step in it 
And so at that time you weren't concerned and years later you find out you, you've got the effects of that or what? Yes, sir. Uh, nobody told us that Asian Orange was going to be as dangerous as it is. You know, it's like I was telling somebody earlier that uh, as a result of Agent Orange, number one, my brother died last year. Uh, I have no feeling from my knees down in, in either leg. But my hands, both of them, constantly burn. Um, and that's from Agent Orange? Yes, sir. So it's part of, part of peripheral neuropathy. And uh, there's nothing you can do for it. I mean, you know, they've tried several different pain procedures on me, and, and it, it don't help. Do you think a lot of Vietnam vets suffer from that? Or, yes, sir. Or died from that? Yes, sir. What, well, tell me what Agent Orange is and what it was used for. It's a dioxin. It, mostly it's, it's made of dioxin, and there's other chemicals in there, I'm not sure. But it was used to defoliate the uh, jungle canopy, so the VC had no place to hide. Was it effective? Sir? Was it effective? Yes, sir. How was it dispensed? Uh, out of the back of a 123, they would spray it. Spray? Yeah. Like a pestis, like a... Crop duster. A crop duster? Yes, sir. What about napalm? Is that effective? Was that what? What is napalm? Napalm is uh, just a big gas bomb. And, uh, I flew a couple of F one hundred missions where we did drop napalm, and uh, it's you know if you're anywhere in the neighborhood of of a napalm drop, um, you literally burnt to death. Another really bad one was uh, white phosphorus. When we dropped white phosphorus bombs, and the problem with that is, it's, it doesn't kill you, but it gets on your skin. And the only way to stop it from burning is to dip in a pool or a creek or something to stop it from burning. There's no other treatment that I'm aware of. How was that dispensed? Like a spray again? Or? No, sir. They uh, F-100s and the F-4s had wing pods and center pods, and they would drop them as a whole entirety, like a, a, a real bomb, in which, in fact, they were, you know, 250, 500-pound bombs that they would you push a button, and it would drop that one uh, bomb. Would it explode or burn like napalm? Um, the white phosphorus? It, it spread over a fairly large area. Was it like a powder? White phosphorus? And yeah, it's... Liquid? Was it liquid? It's, uh, it's a powder. And it burns. I know some yeah. pictures or heard some things. Ooh. Yeah, that's not a, not a good way to go. Do we still use that today, you think, in the military? Uh, I'm sure we do. And we still use napalm. Yeah. So, yeah, you were uh, on the Hueys, but you weren't a pilot, right? No, sir. Okay. I was strictly a photographer. How much of the time do you think you spent on the Huey helicopters? So how much, half of your time, quarter of your time? Oh, I probably had... I really didn't spend a lot of time. Uh, I had about an eighth of my time on Hueys and an eighth of my time on the OB-10 Bronco, uh, which was used for forward air controllers. Most of my other time was spent strictly with the AC-130 gunship. And that's, the, that's what it's called, an AC-130. Right. So when, when would the uh, ground troops call in? Would they call these uh, planes in for support or what? We got called in about, I can remember about five or six times for troops in contact. And we 
we strafed pretty close to their position. I bet they are pretty quick, pretty fast jets or planes. They're four engine turboprops. Does Vietnam have any significance in your life today or is it just something that happened a long time ago? Well, it's pretty significant because number one, I can't walk half the time. And when I do stand, uh, um, I have to hold on to something because I, I, I tend to, I don't have any balance. Do you have a cane? No, I, I you normally use a chair. What about, what, as far as the significance, I mean, I guess just uh, memories of it? Is it something that happened a long time ago, or is it something that you think about all every day? I think about it, well, not every day now. I think about it fairly often. And um, I told my wife, if, if they would uh, let me right now, with, even with all my infirmities, if they would let me go back on the C-130 as a photographer, I'd be over there more. I uh, sure would. Do you have good memories of those days? or? Yes, yeah, sir. We had a bunch of good people. Uh, I couldn't ask for any better group of, of photographers. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I still keep in touch with several of them. You ever been to the Vietnam Wall? No, but I don't want to go. We had one of our airplanes go down uh, in December when they couldn't get in touch with me. The airplane flew without a photographer, and it just so happened that that airplane went down. Mm. And the crew that was on that airplane is has a, a certain place on that wall yeah. that you know they're all grouped together has some really great commanders in the 16th SOS which we were attached to to, to fly um, they treated us just like we were an, oh, an actual crew member on the C-130 you know we were we were one of the guys Adrian, as a veteran, tell me what uh, the American flag means and represents to you. I don't know. Uh, most of the time I cry. When it, when they play, when they play the national anthem, and I see these kids today talking, joking. They don't understand what the flag's for. And I just want to take them and jerk a knot in their nose because it's everything. It's everything. How about freedom? What does freedom mean to you or mean to you? Freedom means a lot of good people good people lost their life in the different wars so that we could have freedom of speech and all the freedoms that we do have. Uh, and it's like they say, uh, freedom is not cheap. Um, I saw a uh, business card last year that every day for a veteran is a bad day. You think there's um, similarities today as they were in Vietnam? You hear stories, you know, like it's people are comparing what's happening today to Vietnam. Yeah, I do. I, I really do. But I find a lot of people support our troops, unlike Vietnam. Yeah. Um... I don't maybe, know. Maybe it's just the, the, the media or the politicians. I don't know. That's what I was getting ready to say. I don't know how to do it politically correct, but if they could do away with all the congressmen, the senators, and let the, let the people run the war like they're supposed to, 
we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in right now. And it really, really tears at me to hear the Democrats and the Republicans fighting for everything <laughs> that we stand for. Um, Man, I'm sorry for tearing up. But. Oh, hey, this is this is unrehearsed. You're doing great. Um, it's interesting what you just said. I'm thinking about what you just said. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't it seem like it's the Democrats that are wanting to withdraw the truth? Right. Where the Republicans are supporting the president. And, right. And uh, so, which side do you go on? I'm a Republican, and I don't, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Well, I, I, I just talked to a group of Marines who came back from Iraq at Camp Pendleton, and they, they, they don't question it. They have a job to do, and they're going to do it. And I got the feeling that if we pull out of there too early, that's not a good thing. If we pull out of Iraq, I guarantee you within a matter of three or four months, they're going to be over here, and we don't have nowhere to run. Well, that's the thing. They say if we don't fight them there, we're going to fight them here. That's right. And we will. Yeah. Well, why can't the Democrats or whoever's trying to do this see that? What's their problem? It's like, I don't understand. They're a bunch of idiots. Excuse me. Well, I'd have to agree but, with you. But they are because, number one, you got Kerry who's got Band-Aid Purple Hearts. Uh, you got uh, the Kennedy... Uh, that's never even been over there or in any war. Mm -hmm. You got Pelosi, who of course wouldn't be there. Uh, I don't know what they're fighting about. You know, you either you either support the troops or you don't. And it's just like Jane Fonda did in Vietnam. She to she really destroyed our mission over there. And, and Pelosi and the Democrats are doing the exact same thing here. Yep, I don't understand it. It bothers me. Um, I'm, I'm for Bush all the way. Yeah, he's going to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. But he's trying to get us out of there, and he's trying to make sure that we win. Now, whether we can or not, I don't know. Because the, the commander's hands are tied with this funding stuff. You know, how can you not fund troops that are over there putting their lives on the line every day for the people that are, are destroying them? It don't make no sense. I think they're thinking they're doing them a favor by voting to withdraw the support or the money, but I don't think they're doing What you're doing is you're giving the enemy a, a date that we're going to pull out. And then they're free to do whatever they want to do. You know, that's the way I look at it. I'm, you know, I've got an 18-year-old daughter who's blind, blind from birth. And she asks me every day to turn the TV off when the news comes on. She can't stand the media coverage of the war. And it's not the Republicans. It's the Democrats. You kind of wonder what fuels their fire to, to, to do this. Is it just all a political thing, or do they really believe that, you know? Um, I wish I knew. I had a lot of Vietnam vets tell me that the military didn't lose the war, the politicians lost the war. Right. That's an interesting statement. They did, and I'll always believe that. Pretty powerful. Are you proud that you're a Vietnam vet? Yes, sir, I am. Do, do people thank you for your service? You know, that's something funny because when they spit on us and threw stuff at us when we come came back from the war, um, I'm literally surprised nowadays. I wear my hat everywhere. And I have two or three of them. I have a Vietnam veterans hat. 
I have this one. Uh, people will stop me wherever I'm at and say, thank you. And that makes up for a lot. I was going to ask you how you, if people do thank you. Um, that, that does. makes you feel good. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing that I ask all veterans at the end of my interview from where you're seated when I tell you. Can you look into the camera and give me a salute? Sure. When I tell you to? Okay, sir, go ahead. Great. Thank you.